Good morning. Good morning. May it please the court and good morning. My name is Roy Black. I'm, on, I'm here on behalf of Mr. Nunes. This is a case about a 17-year-old boy who has two homicide detectives go to his home. He and his parents, instead of talking to them, or after talking to them, hire a lawyer and go to the state attorney's office to seek some type of a deal, to seek some concession. They originally give a proffer, they seek immunity, the state attorney says no, we are not authorized to give any plea, no individual assistant, only the homicide committee can do it. You have to give a statement, we have to verify it, it goes to the homicide committee, and then we offer you a plea. This happened over the course of the case. I'm sorry, who told him that? The head of the homicide division, Jay Pruner, testified that he told the attorney that this, that day when they arrived there. Does it make a difference that my understanding is the, the part that he was told you'll get a deal if you fully cooperate and we verify its truthfulness, does it make a difference that that came from law enforcement officers and then the discussion was with the state attorney's office? Well, it, it, it makes it stronger coming from the state attorney's office because the cases generally say police officers can make various promises that are not binding on the state, although sometimes they are, depending if they say it comes from the state attorney. But here we don't have that problem because the head of the homicide division talks to uh, Garrett Noon's lawyer and says, look, you give a statement. We will submit it to the Homicide Committee, and then the offer comes from them, not from us, because I'm not authorized to give it. And we're not giving you immunity. We're not giving you any promises right now. You give this statement, and subsequent to this, some type of a deal could be made. It is, but is the language there, there will be a deal made, or then there will be a decision whether a deal will be offered or not? Yes, it could be either one. I don't think it makes any difference. because. What's, what's involved here is that the defendant was 17 years old and his lawyer reasonably believed that this was the beginning of the process. Now what happened in the court below, and by the way, after they give a statement, after a plea can't be reached, then the state goes to trial, uses his statement and all the evidence obtained as a result of that. And it's our position, this was very unfair. The state attorney's office created these policies. You have to remember, they've got all the power here. They're the ones who create the policy, the rules, the forms, the customs. The defense lawyer and the defendant have no choice but to follow their rules if you want to get a plea. So they're told these are the rules. They go ahead and give this statement. It is true. In the statement, they say, we give you no promises. We're not promising you anything. We're not promising you 25 years. We're not promising you probation. We're not promising you life imprisonment. There are no promises. All that will happen is you give this statement, we verify it, it goes to the Homicide Committee, and then a plea can be offered. Under the rule, under 90.410, the statute, and the rule 3.172 sub I, a statement made in connection with plea bargaining, a negotiation, the process, cannot be used. All we ask for in this case is that his statement not be admitted against him. Because the, the real unfairness here is the state created this catch-22 procedure. You give the statement, we then verify it, we offer you the plea, and everything's great if the plea is accepted. But, but you concede that with regard to these discussions that Mr. Nunez assumed and his counsel believed, but did his counsel not fail him in failing to secure what the agreement was to be? Well. What is a lawyer to do? Today what happens is that many courts have said lawyers are ineffective if you don't seek a plea bargain. Because 95% of all cases are plead, pled out. And there are cases, particularly on the federal side, that said you have to urge your client to work out a plea bargain because that's usually in their best interest. So the lawyer goes with the client to the office and they said this is the procedure. What happens if he did, if the lawyer said don't do this, and he goes to trial and gets life imprisonment. By, by, by an analogy to a, the civil context, when you're going to engage in settlement discussions, it would not be unusual to have a telephone call or a letter saying, oh, by the way, we're going to enter settlement talks and they're confidential, et cetera, et cetera. And yes. I don't see that anything like that was done here. True, but there was a discussion. 
there was a discussion before the statement was taken in which the lawyer sought immunity. And the state said, and reasonably so, we can't offer you immunity without knowing the facts of the case. You have to uh, give us something. And remember, two homicide detectives had gone to talk to the defendant and he didn't confess to them. If the defendant just wanted to confess, he wouldn't have hired a lawyer and gone to the state attorney's office. So reasonably, what was, he, what was in his mind? And what was objectively in his mind? Was he seeking a deal by going to the state attorney's office? So the state attorney is in a position of either by just the unfolding of events, beginning negotiation process, which has the ramifications that you're describing here, or they have to decide from the get-go, before they ever hear anything, we will never deal this case. You need to understand, no matter what you do or what you say, there will be no deals forthcoming to put him on notice such that if he says anything more, it can be used against him. Is that, is that what I'm understanding? No, I, I think that that's one way of doing it, but I think there's a compromise as well. First of all, if they had gone there and there was some agreement that, this, that you give a statement without any uh, chance of this inf or, or without any deal going on, in other words, signing some type of an agreement saying what the statement meant, that we're not going to give you a plea based upon this statement. That would be one thing. But they had to know, I mean reasonably, the state attorney had to know when you come there with a lawyer seeking immunity, seeking some type of benefit that the defendant had in his mind that this is the beginning of the process, and then you tell him, not that this is, there's no plea bargain, but our process is you give the statement, we verify it. If it turns out to be true, it goes to the Homicide Committee because I cannot offer you a plea. The Homicide Committee will offer you the plea. They created this rule. They've created this process. And once you create this process, isn't it fair to be bound by it? How can they make a catch-22 saying you follow our process, you get to a plea, but if you follow it and we don't get to a plea, you've confessed to first degree murder and you get life in prison? That would be hardly fair that, and it's a catch-22. We're not, we're not creating traps for the unwary here. But, but isn't that the, 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 the failing of the, and I know it's real easy to sit here and, and look back at what happened, but wasn't that the failing of his attorney that if, if he was going to give this information you know, I, I got the guns, I handed the guns out, I had a gun, I bought the gas, I poured the gas, I participated. Yes. Didn't she need to do something? Because he, he was putting himself, as you say, in harm's way of a life sentence by doing that. But what the courts have said, and, and, and I think the, most, the case closest on this is the Russell case out of the first district. And what Russell does is cite to a federal case which was interpreting Rule 11, which is similar to these rules, which says statements are inadmissible if made at any point during a discussion in which the defendant seeks to obtain concessions from the government in return from a plea. Was this defendant seeking some type of con concession? We have to look at this case from the viewpoint of the defendant, not from the state attorney. They could th have in their mind, well, we're not going to offer a deal or whatever. But the defendant, did he subjectively believe it? Certainly he subjectively believed it. Was it reasonable for him to believe that this was the beginning of the process? We have evidence in the statement about his lawyer explaining to him, this is how you get a plea bargain. And the judge what, what on- he, what, he, what he believed was the first one to get to, the, to LEO was going to get a good deal. Yes. Okay. Yes. And, 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 and so that's the subjective part. Yes. Okay, so then the objective elements come in by virtue of the policies that the state attorney had in place for processing this? Well, I think we, can, we have a better case than that because Judge Timmerman, after the December 6th hearing, made a finding of fact that it was perfect, I think of what he said, it was perfectly logical to expect preferential treatment. He used the term, it was a race to the courthouse and what have you. He made a finding of fact after the December 6th hearing that it was logical for them to believe that this was going to end up with a preferential treatment. And it, and it is logical when you think about it. He wasn't there to confess. He wasn't there to ruin his case, to make it impossible to have a trial. He and his lawyer went there uh, to get some type of a deal. And I know it's easy. 
as Your Honor said, to look back uh, and say, well, could things have been done better? Sure, things could have been done better. But when you look back and, and what the cases say, we're not here, you know, making little exactitudes like this on, on a contract. This, these interpretations have to be interpreted broadly. We encourage plea bargaining. We encourage communication. So what do you happen? Do you tell the 17-year-old boy, yes, give a statement because this is what's going to end up in you getting some deal from the state of something less than life or death? And I, I think it's clear when you look at this uh, that this was in their mind, and as Judge Timmerman said, it was perfectly logical to believe that. Now, what the lower courts went off on is that there was no promise. We're not saying there was a promise at the beginning. Plea bargaining doesn't start with a promise, it ends with a promise. It's not until after you get the bargain that everybody makes promises. And also the courts below were saying this was a voluntary statement. We're not suggesting this was involuntary in any way. It was just part of the beginning of the negotiation of the process in order to obtain the plea bargain. There's a second issue that I wanted to address, and that dealt with the jury instruction on independent act. Oh, by the way, I was asked if I could reserve three minutes. I you think can. I forgot to ask And that. let me just ask you one last question. Yes, sir. If, if on your, your point you just made there, if the state, instead of offering him 30 years, had offered him 10 years and he turned it down, went to trial and got life, the result would be the same yes. in your view. Yes, it would make no difference because the statement was made in connection with an effort to obtain or an attempt to obtain a plea bargain. Clearly, if they had offered some lesser deal, it probably would have been taken. And by the way, we're not here suggesting that the deal is wrong or they should have offered less or this court should tell them to offer a different deal or anything like that. Once the deal fell through and was not consummated, they could not use the statement. They could use all the other evidence that they have, but they could not use his statement. The second issue I just wanted to argue today was a jury instruction on independent act. This young man was charged with felony murder, and clearly there was evidence that there was a robbery going to occur or an attempted robbery at some point. The sole defense in this case was that the killing occurred either before the robbery uh, occurred or independent of the robbery. At times, the defense characterized it as an assassination or it was during a, 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 a practice session, not the actual robbery, that it was they had an agreement not to do any shooting, that the defendant didn't have any bullets in his gun. There were numerous issues like that raised, which are not important for this court to determine if that's sufficient or not as a defense or it's sufficient enough for a verdict of not guilty. The only question is, was there some evidence, any evidence, that in this record which allowed them to have this jury instruction? And what this court and other courts have said is no matter how flimsy the evidence, if there's any evidence in which uh, a court uh, or jury could find on this, this issue, you have to give the instruction. And remember, this is a jury trial not a judge trial. The jury should have been instructed on this. And that was the only defense. The only defense in this case was that it was the killing was independent of the robbery. And the court denied the instruction saying, well, the defendant didn't testify, so therefore he's not entitled to it. And the defense said, well, you introduced his two-hour statement at the evidence, which was enough, and there was other witnesses. And then in the middle of the summation, which I think is the most crucial part of this, the defense lawyer asked for additional time for an argument, and the judge said, why? You don't have a legal defense to this charge. The judge, in fact, had granted a directed verdict in favor of the state by not giving this jury instruction. So I think it was crucial to the fairness of this trial. The other two issues we would submit on, on the brief, if the court has any questions about either of these two issues, I would be uh, Happy to answer them. We've got five minutes for rebuttal. Thank you, sir. You're Thank welcome. you. May it please the court, I'm John Klawakowski. I represent the state. Um, as to issue one, obviously it's the state's position that the trial court did not abuse its discretion in denying the suppression. I want to start out with, first we have to remember this was 
pre-charging, this was in an investigation stage, when, he, when the defendant comes on the 19th of September, there are no charges being filed in this case, the state is investigating it. I, I thought part of the state's <coughs> position was that the case against the defendant was so strong that they wouldn't have needed to make him an offer. They would not, because once, we, once the state was able to talk to other witnesses, Rosangela Pena, there was felony murder wrapped, wrapped in a bow for the state. So they, we don't even need the statements. We have him, and, and when the officers interview him two days after, they get tips that Mr. Nunez is involved. But, they, but my point is that if, if it's pre-charge, it really d didn't matter in this case because they knew the culpability uh, of Mr. Nunez. Yes, they did. But pre-charge matters at, at every case that appellant has cited saying there are plea negotiations, every case that was cited, every case that I have found deals with somebody that's already been charged with an existing charge. No case I can find says... So you can't have plea negotiations until there's been an indictment, is that right? I don't think you can. How can you? But the rule, the rule not, is not, not that broad. The, the rule would not preclude that. No. But there is no case out there that I've found or that the defense has found that says that. So it's really hard to have plea negotiations if you're, you're still in an investigation stage. What well, I want to get to you, is... Don't you charge bargain all the time? Excuse me? Doesn't the state charge bargain all the time? Charge bargain. Yeah. We could charge you with first degree murder, but with, based upon your cooperation, we're only going to charge you with second degree or only going to charge you with, with the robbery. We'll, you know, we'll... The state which, doesn't which know what they the have. The thing is given immunity, but it, I mean, to, to suggest that you can't come in and begin any kind of negotiations until there's been a charge filed is to suggest that uh, this... It, it makes it a lot more difficult, and it's, especially from the state's point of view, it makes it extremely difficult because what happens is they get Sandoval's statement, and of course, Sandoval's saying, well, he was the shooter. Nunez is saying, well, Sandoval was the shooter. So, of course, the state doesn't know what they have yet. That's so, why investigation so why has to take the, place. So why doesn't the state say, until we decide what we're going to charge you with, we don't even want to talk to you. Just go it's not the state's don't... obligation to say, ignore your counsel's advice, don't so, talk to so us. So then you say, and if you give us a statement, and if we can verify it, and we'll send it to the committee, and if the committee offers you a deal, then you get a deal. But the only way the process is triggered is for you to give a statement. The state never says that. Allow me to quote okay. State Attorney Hart. Prior to Mr. Nunez making his statement, he says, and I'm going to quote on page 215 of the record, I'm not making you any promises whatsoever as to what's going to happen with your case, whether you're going to be charged, arrested, what would happen if you were charged and arrested. That's crystal clear. The, other than the state saying, ignore your counsel's advice, but don't did, talk to did us. Did he go what? on to say that the only way that a negotiation is possible is for there to be a statement made, for it to be verified, and I don't then recall the that. So he never told them anything about a homicide committee. He never it's told not the them state's anything about that point. He didn't tell them anything. It's not the state's obligation at that point did to the discourage the statement. But that's what I ask you. Did the state make the? Did the state attorney tell him, "This is the way this has to happen. You have to make a statement. It has to be verified. It goes to the homicide committee, and the homicide committee will then make a decision." The state told his attorney that. He told his attorney that. Okay. And what has to happen before? This process that ends up with the homicide committee is begun. What has to happen? I'm not following your question. Okay. There's a procedure that the homicide committee is going to make the final decision of whether a deal be offered. Yes. Nothing goes to that homicide committee until what? It. Until there's a statement made. Not and necessarily. It's and, well, that's what that's what you that's what the, no, that's, that's what was explained to his lawyer that I can't give you a deal. That's what his lawyer testified to. By the way, well, Mr. Are you Pruner, sure? Okay, let me ask you this. Mr. Pruner uh, testified at this hearing, too. St Assistant State Attorney Pruner testified, and he said, I promised them nothing. I promised them nothing. They were not invited here. They came unannounced, uninvited, and that is a major dispute here as to whether they just okay. showed up because it was a rush to the courthouse. Regardless, I promise you nothing. However. There was no however. Either. Okay. So he says, I promise you nothing, and that was the end of the discussion. Nothing was ever told to his lawyer after that. What more is the state to do other that than say, well, stop and you, But you you're keep going, what should the state do? I want to know what did the, what did the state do? This did the state say anything more than, I promise you nothing? Basically, that's what we said. Did, they, we did, did the state say, the homicide committee has to make the decision? 
It's not clear from the record when that was said. The okay, Homicide okay, Committee okay, came out are, in the suppression here. Okay. Are you, are you suggesting that this was not told to uh, the defendant's attorney? It's not clear from the record, Your Honor. Okay. So, so we've, got a, we've got a contest on the facts as to whether this uh, attorney was even told of this procedure. I agree. I agree. There's a, there's a question of fact here. And in this case, Judge Timmerman came out in favor of the state saying that and there Judge, was no plea negotiation. So, he, no so he, says, he says, I believe the state, this attorney was never told of this process, and oh, by the way, it's perfectly reasonable for this young man to believe he was, in, he was uh, looking for something, some kind of preference. He made that kind of conclusion, having decided factually that the state attorney never told the defense counsel Judge this Timmerman, process. Judge Timmerman found that there were no plea no negotiations and no discussions. He found and, there and, were no. An interesting point I would like, I'd like to point out to the court, there were two suppression hearings here. And it's a key distinction we have to find. The first suppression hearing, because um, the defense ripped me for going into the voluntariness of the statement in my answer brief. Bec I did that because in the first suppression hearing, it was all about whether there was a quid pro quo, whether it was a voluntary statement. After that suppression hearing, the defense could see Judge Timmerman wasn't going to have that. There's a second suppression hearing where all of a sudden it's interesting. Now we're bringing up Rule 9 uh, 9410, which wasn't even discussed in suppression hearing one. If I'm a defense lawyer, I'm bringing that up in suppression hearing one. This was an afterthought. Suppression hearing two is about the plea negotiations where all of a sudden counsel has created a plea negotiation issue when it wasn't even mentioned in the first suppression motion, it wasn't mentioned in the first suppression hearing. This is an afterthought because there never were plea discussions. The state never offered anything. The state never entertained anything. I'm sorry. So, so, you're, so just make sure I understand. It's your position factually. There was no discussion of a homicide committee. There was no discussion of the need to verify a statement. There was no discussion of the need for a statement to be given before the process was started. The record will show what it shows, but that is my recollection. I don't want to misspeak what the record shows, but that is my recollection. The state offered anything, and this okay, okay. So you don't you don't think there has to be an offer to be a no, negotiation? Do no, you? there does not. There does not have to be a firm offer, and even the statute states in there that it can be discussions leading up to a plea. There never was any discussion on it. The state did everything they could but say, stop talking to us. Which, and that's not the state's which, position to do well, that. Well, let me ask you this. Did somebody represent to Judge Timmerman that they were told about a homicide committee and about a need for verification? I, for in the suppression hearing, I believe so. Yes, and I did anybody get on the stand and say, Judge, that never happened? No. We never told them that? Not that I can recall. Did anybody ever acknowledge they did tell him? Well, here's the problem again. Did they? Did anybody ever acknowledge they did tell him that? Uh, I, well, Mr. Mr. Pruner obviously knows about the process, and he says he says the process. Excuse me, makes it a complete impossibility that this could have ever happened. Did he acknowledge that he advised the attorney of that? I don't recall. I don't recall. I, again, what I don't I, think that's I'm an important. What I'm trying to get in my mind is whether Judge Timmerman is presented with a set of facts that are totally contradictory and he has resolved the facts one way, which is his right to do, or whether he had a set of facts but just came to a different conclusion as a matter of law based on those facts. The and state, that's the cannot, the state cannot anyway. disprove something that never happened. It's not the state's obligation to do that. Well, I would, I would think if a lawyer got on the stand and said, Judge, State Attorney so-and-so told me this, this, and this, the State Attorney so-and-so didn't say it, they would give him say, Judge, I never told him that. Again, Your Honor, it, it, I, obviously the court thinks that's an important factual distinction. I, yeah. I disagree with that because if you look at the second tier, it's a two-tier analysis, subjective, which we're not conceding that the subjective analysis, they even met prong one. But even if they did, which is, it, it's a lot harder burden for the state to prove prong one, prong two you have to say, was this reasonably objective? And you have to still look at, was the state indicating a willingness to plead bargain and in fact solicited the statement? We solicited nothing. We did, okay, not, we did so not make an appointment for him to come down. That's the point I'm making. If there is a statement to someone that the only way we can even think about offering you something is if you do this, this, and this, that's one thing. That seems to be suggesting if you do these things, we'll think about it. But if you're saying they were never told that, then it makes their subjective uh, feeling or their subjective understanding totally unreasonable because they were never told that they could possibly, again, possibly get again, a plea Your Honor, because, the plea, because of the uh, homicide committee 
deliberation. The, the statement made by the state attorney prior to Mr. Nunez making any kind of incriminating statements sums up what the state's position is. We're promising you nothing. We're promising you nothing as far as what you're going to be charged with. But and again, this is pre-Miranda. The, so the, the context is where Mr. Nunez shows up with his father and a lawyer, mm -hmm. put aside whether it's announced or unannounced. The lawyer has a meeting with the state attorneys. They apparently lay out what Mr. the younger Mr. Nunez might say. The testimony in the record is that this was, we understood there were no deals because we had been, had been represented to us. This is the process it has to go through. So you need to tell us what you need to know. I mean, it's not like the kid's just showing up off the street. This is very well orchestrated with his lawyer. There's the, the pre-meeting with the state attorney. Obviously, there, there's something going on to get well, well, some discussion going. Sure there is. And this, this is, I better get into the state before Sandoval gets in there because one of us is going to get jammed up, and it better not be me. So as I think Judge Timmerman found, this was a race to the courthouse. Who's going to get there first and give their statement? And the but medical so evidence... So that, that doesn't make a difference. Sure it does. It makes a difference as to who's the shooter and who's, the, who's well, not well, the so shooter. Let me ask you, if these events at the state attorney's office were not plea negotiations, what were they? This was a, this was a statement. Assume that Ms. Tesci was not there. This is no different than any other state, statement where... A suspect gives a statement to police officers, and what's the police officer supposed to say? He's not in custody, so Miranda's not required at that point. This is a suspect giving a statement to police, and he's throwing himself on the mercy of the court eventually, and that's what he's told later. You see, what concerns me is, is what you just pointed out, that you know, if, if this didn't exist, I, I wouldn't be too concerned, but when he's told, look, who, whoever gets to the station house first and cuts a deal gets a break, okay? From his, from his attorney. In her experience, that's what happens. Well, he, was told, he was told that specifically by law enforcement. Well, it? that's disputed, too, as to what the office, the detectives come on later and say, I was proud of you for telling the truth, and it, the court will consider it. The court will consider it. Not that the state attorney is going to offer you a deal. And I, I wanted to point out, uh, Judge Watley, I believe you talked about the federal rule. Just as an interesting side note, Rule 11E has been amended, and our courts have, courts have adopted the federal rule. The rule. Rule 11 has been amended to only include exclusions when it comes to um, discussions with the U.S. attorney. So if we're following the federal rule, again, we should be following that discussions only apply to the state attorney. The federal rule has thrown out any kind of issue when it comes to only investigating officers. No, That's I a significant think. distinction here because we're going back to a quid pro quo then, which is what suppression hearing one was about. Suppression hearing one was not about plea negotiations. This was an afterthought when they realized we weren't, we're not going to win on voluntariness. That's why I addressed it in my brief because there's such an issue in this court with voluntariness of a juvenile statements and we want to make sure we're okay with the voluntariness too so I didn't it wasn't my argument was not irrelevant your honors I'm sorry it was not irrelevant as to the voluntariness of the statement it was very relevant because that was the majority of the suppression here was on the voluntariness of his statement well I understand you got you got gears shifted on you but back to my my question the defense counsel asserts that Mr. Nunez was told by police detectives that the first person to come forward and cooperate would be the person that got a deal. Yes. Now, do you dispute that? Do I dis well, do I dispute that defense counsel said that? No. Do you dispute that that happened? I dispute that he was told that. Yes, I do. Yes, I do. And actually, um, I, I know in the brief they're also laying the groundwork for ineffective assistance on the face of the record. Well, Ms. Tesci who is here, by the way, is a seasoned attorney. First of all, privilege was not waived at this suppression hearing. If this turns into post-conviction proceeding, privilege will have been waived. And there will then be the ability to, to talk, for her to talk about what negotiations came on, what discussions came out. It's also significant that she got a 30-year deal for him, which for a 17-year-old young man is a lot different than a life sentence, which he ended up taking. He comes out of jail 47 years old. He still has a life. That's not ineffective on the face of the record. No way. No how. 
She hasn't waived privilege yet. You can't find an effective on the face yeah, of this she record. She actually comes out a little earlier than that. Well, with gain time, yes, probably. But again, that's a lot better than a life sentence. So this is a seasoned lawyer who knew her business, who knew to get him to the courthouse as soon as possible before Sandoval came and said, no, you were the shooter. And Sandoval did say, you're the shooter. Um, I'd like to briefly address the independent act instruction. And again, Mr. Black says that... Well, well, on the independent act, Mr. Nunez secured the guns, pulled out a gun, was present when the victim was shot and killed, bought the gas, I think that was even videoed, poured the gas the on the vehicle. Yes, he threw right. the sock. I just wanted to address it as far as the Mark Thomas case, which the defense relies on significantly. And the Mark Thomas case, Judge Northcutt wrote the opinion out in seven, seven years ago, and it is a case that has stuck with me for seven years, and I've been waiting for an opportunity to review it with this court. And I did seek cert, uh, cert with the Florida Supreme Court, and it was denied, of course. But the Mark Thomas case shows why it's an impossibility to get independent act instruction here. I'm not disagreeing with Judge Northcutt's findings in the Mark Thomas case. Mark Thomas case shows what hoops have to be run through to get an independent act instruction in a scenario like this and Mark Thomas. When the scenario is, we're going to go rob somebody. We got guns. I wasn't planning on shooting him. He did it as an independent act. Mark Thomas says the reason the independent act instruction was required is defendant Mark Thomas tried to stop the shooting. He waved it down. He tried to stop the shooting. He affirmatively tried to stop it. Mark Thomas also said there was no issue as to elimination of witnesses because Shooter in Mark Thomas' case did not try to eliminate the other witness to the robbery. Well, here, the only witness to the robbery was killed. So obviously, this facilitated the robbery. This was not an independent act which occurred outside the common scheme. If you come to a robbery with guns, you've given the loaded gun to the so-called shooter, you're not entitled to this instruction. So it was not a directed verdict by the judge to deny that instruction. As to the other issues, I'll rely on my brief as well. Thank you. Thank you. I'd ask the state, uh, the court to affirm the judgment of sentence. Rebuttal. Thank you. I really don't understand this, the state's argument on point one. In their brief on page six, where they cite Jay Pruner's testimony, they say he advises that they cannot give immunity, and the procedure to be followed is a sworn statement with no strings attached, citing to page 421 of the hearing, in which the testimony is uncontested, the same thing the defense attorney testified to. He says, so my routine at that time, and it remains today is to advise, as Ms. Teshi has testified to that, we could not give immunity because we don't know the involvement of the witness. He goes down the same page. I don't have the authority in our office to make an offer pertaining to a potential suspect in a homicide. And my routine would have been to advise counsel, Ms. Teshi in this case, of that, and of the procedures to be followed, which would have been a sworn statement with no strings attached that after the sworn statement would be elicited from the defendant, we would get together with law enforcement and in the context of all the information try to assess his credibility. If in fact we're assured in our minds of the credibility of the witness testimony, then the case and the facts would be presented to the Homicide Committee and we'd be discussed among the Homicide Committee whether we would want to and where we would want to use this witness in the case and make a deal with him. The statement that was given at the state attorney's office was given to the state attorney. The two detectives were present, but the initial questioning was by the prosecutor, in which the prosecutor says, in question to Mr. Nunes, I work for the state attorney's office. I'm an attorney over here. We're now conducting an investigation, etc." This was not just talking to two police officers. In any event, what the assistant attorney general told you about the testimony of the two police officers is inaccurate. Detective Losat testified at page 45 of the hearing. Question, is it your testimony you never said to anyone that the first one that comes forward is going to have a better chance for a fair treatment or favorable treatment? Answer, the first part of your statement as you were phrasing your question is the first person, yes, that would be something I would say. But the second part about favorable treatment is not correct. 
Detective Bunton, page 54. But I have frequently said that the person who is cooperative and truthful is regularly given consideration more so than the person we have to prove our case against. So they all admit that, but the most important part is that there is no factual dispute. The, Jay Pruner, the head of the Homicide Committee, testified that he told the lawyer this. The lawyer also testified to this. The required first step for the plea here was giving the sworn statement, and I think that's uncontested. If the court has uh, any other questions, that's, that's really the only other point I wanted to make on rebuttal. Thank you both.